we are in, in uh, a unique situation with respect to race because black people were once the property of white people. Mm -hmm. And I want to delve into the psychology of that. And that may be really difficult for some who watch this video to hear. Yeah. We were once their property. Yeah. And when you own property, you've owned property, you feel as though you can do as you please with that property. And there's an entire framework, an entire psychology around ownership and the value you derive <clears throat> from that ownership. And I think one of the, I think one of the reasons that maybe moments struggle to become movements is with respect to race, there is a contingent of people who don't want to release that psychology. I mean, an entire, not of ownership, but the psychology of well. And what I mean by well, you are part of the group that were once owners. You're the descendant of the group that was once owners. And there is a, there is a comfort in that because we all know that humans rank things, right? That's human nature to rank. And you rank higher than others. Mm -hmm. And also an entire society has been constructed to allow that rank to help you have advantage in life. Some wittingly that you know of, that you, you know, wittingly take advantage of, others unwittingly that you just passively take advantage of by virtue of being part of a group. Sure. And when you ask people to relinquish a certain framework of thinking, especially now, I think in the clear kind of George Floyd moments, it's, it's obvious, but it's easy to, uh, to return to your safety zone of thinking about your life, especially when you feel threatened, you know, in, in some smaller moment that is not a national, international, you know, you know, headline grabbing thing, right? Maybe a black person gives you bad attitude or whatever at a store or cuts you off in traffic, whatever it may be. And those small moments still give people an opportunity to retain that psychology and to live in that motivation, the motivation of I'm ranking higher and that feels good. Yeah. And so when I say I wanted to challenge you, I, 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 I want, what I'm trying to say is that when, and you know this, you understand the human mind, that when you are asking people to give up something that has literally been the bedrock of, the, of their being, right, as a white person, which that is really hard to do. And I think that's one of the reasons why moments become struggle to become movements. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, as maybe the white person asks his or herself, you know, well, how much do I need to do? Like, I'm willing to alter, but do I have to radically alter my worldview all at once? Or can I evolve it over time? Yeah. Kind of how it did with homosexuals, right? And of which I'm a part of that group. Yeah. And that's, that's another thing I'm like, this is interesting. So at one time we were booed. <laughs> now we're on hell, we host redecorating shows. Like, you know, and I think, and I think, I'm just using that as an analogy because it's the closest thing I know in my own life because I am gay. Yeah. But, I, you know, that had to evolve over time. And we live in such a young country and a lot of people forget that the US is really young vis-a-vis -vis a lot of these other countries. And that has grown and changed so fast that I think sometimes we, you know, we step back and maybe regress a little just because we're fearful of so much change, so much alteration to a worldview at once. But I do like to speak to slavery very specifically yeah. because of the psychology of ownership. ownership. I, re I, and I remember having this conversation with a Latino man a few years ago, and I said, yes, you all have the other races of people have been you know, discriminated against, done wrong, whatever parlance you want to use by white people. But I said, it is slightly different. I said, and I, and I, I illustrated it at the time, I said, there was a day in this country, 
and I pointed to another friend of ours where I would have been his property. And he could have done with me whatever he amused. He could have taught me to read. He could have beat the hell out of me. He could have sold me. He could have fucked me. Yeah. Whatever, because I'm his property. Yeah. And, the, and the psychology of ownership is powerful. And you're, you're talking about something that you once owned now wants to be on your level. Mm-hmm. that's 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 po- all i'm saying is that it's powerful yeah and there's no undercurrents in it in society today when you 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 talk a lot about this idea of the psychology of ownership what how do you think that materializes across the white population so okay. let's, let's let's ask a really specific question <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly do a you justification, think, a justification. You think I carry around a feeling of ownership over Black people? And well, in what way, if, if yes, if yes, in what way does that manifest? What would show you differently? What would it, how would you be able to see, what would you see that would make you convinced of a white person and let's not say even say a broad range of a white person not feeling that sense of ownership and that right over a black life or again what's encompassed in a black life like how would you know that a white person didn't have that what would prove that to you to watch the rest of that episode go ahead and click the video below me to see a different compelling healing race episode you can click the video below me we look forward to seeing you in the next video